Have we been looking in the wrong areas to solve the Voynich Manuscript? Instead of just trying to decipher an unknown language, we should also be working to solve fundamental questions with this mystery book. The Voynich Manuscript cannot be solved without considering a number of vital factors which at the moment are not given the attention they deserve. In this episode on the Voynich Manuscript, Medieval to Modern will present issues which may seem unconventional or even controversial, though by revealing these issues, new approaches and fresh perspectives perspectives should bring renewed excitement into solving the Voynich Manuscript. Hello everyone, my name is Craig, host of Medieval to Modern. We feature fascinating information from civilization's medieval ages. Thank you for joining us today and please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to help grow this channel. If you have not done so already, make sure to watch our great episode titled The Voynich Manuscript, Most Mysterious Book Ever, for more important information on this fascinating unsolved mystery. The link will be provided in the description box below. Now, prepare to receive fresh perspectives on the Voynich Manuscript. In the view of Medieval to Modern, these questions need to be answered in order to help decode the Voynich Manuscript. We shall begin with the physical composition of the manuscript itself. Many people do not realize the current cover of the Voynich Manuscript is not an original. The goat skin casing we see today is thought to have replaced its original covering while at the Collegio Romano in Rome, Italy. Research suggests the Collegio Romano is where the Voynich Manuscript was held during a 200 year period Period, its whereabouts are officially unaccounted for. Closer examination suggests that a wood cover and a tan leather inside cover were the previous coverings for this manuscript. Here is where important information on the provenance of this manuscript would have been contained. On the cover, one would expect to see the title, authors if listed, style of writing, and materials used to make these covers. Any of these great clues would have yielded valuable knowledge, especially with modern scientific methods like carbon dating. So, do these original covers still exist? Located in the same place as this manuscript was held for 200 years before these items were also relocated? When Jan Merrick Marcy sent the Voynich manuscript to his friend Athanasius Kircher at Collegio Romano in 1665, we note an important detail. There was no mention in the cover letter of a damaged cover or any alterations to the manuscript's physical appearance. Also note that Mr. Kircher wished to acquire the book from its previous owner, Georg Baresh, though he refused to sell it. It is very interesting to realize Mr. Kircher never returned the book to Jan Merrick Marcy. This is just one in a number of odd circumstances while the Voynich manuscript was held at Carigio Romano. Opening the Voynich manuscript, we find our next key discovery. The current manuscript contains around 240 pages. The research indicates additional pages are missing. It has often been suspected there was a manual or code key for the Voynich manuscript. Though what if this manual were not separate from the folio of current manuscript pages? Could these missing pages have contained the code key for the whole manuscript? Related to this query, was this an intentional action because the cipher key was written in an identifiable language that would help decode the manuscript's so-called Voynichese script? Research also suggests the pages in this current manuscript were reordered, with the original sequence quite different from what we see today. Why was this reordering done? Once again, there is no mention of this in the letter of Jan Merrick Marcy to Mr. Kircher. It appears this reordering in a extraction of missing pages happened after the manuscript arrived from Mr. Kircher at Codigio Romano. If this happened during its 200 years at the college, it would also necessitate a new cover for the manuscript. Even if the wooden cover was somewhat worn, the more durable leather cover would most likely have been in satisfactory condition. The physical evidence with the current Voynich manuscript reveals another fact. Some parchments are thicker than others, suggesting replacements of original parchments. Once again, these pieces may have contained valuable clues or codes for helping to solve the Voynich manuscript. Could this too have happened at Collegio Romano during its 200 year stay after delivery to Mr. Kircher? Did Mr. Kircher discover information so valuable he could not let the Voynich manuscript leave the college in its original form? During its 200 years at Collegio Romano, it is fair to assume Mr. Kircher was not the only person that attempted to decipher the Voynich manuscript. Who did he refer the mystery book to and what other people at the college had the Voynich manuscript in their possession? If it was an intact book on arrival at the college, could the key code pages have been removed and other pages replaced so it could not be translated? With the presence of Latin script, we can narrow down the origins of the current Voynich manuscript to communities or locations where Latin script was 
was introduced before the period of 1404 to 1438 AD. Also, multilingual communities which hosted travelers or foreign contacts might be an added feature of the location where it was written. This would give the manuscript authors comfort writing in two languages or more if they already had practice translating strange script back into their own language. Latin script originated around the 7th century BCE in Italy and has changed continually ever since. If the Voynich manuscript was copied from existing source material, which was a common practice by medieval knowledge seekers and bookmakers, the original information source could be much earlier than the current manuscript. Remember that the carbon dating of the Voynich manuscript is not being questioned, which is from 1404 to 1438 AD. Under this assumption, it is the source material from which the manuscript may have been obtained which is being brought into focus. In medieval times, common people did not have the ability to write in Latin, let alone read it. A scribe like those at a monastery scriptorium would be educated and versed in the writing of Latin, or a learned person with a good education. The lack of errors in this manuscript reminds one of a scribe copying from source material. In addition, the scribing process would use a separate illustrator for drawings. Research into the Voynich manuscript states there was most likely a separate person used for illustrations, which would conform to this assumption. So, how will could a possible original source manuscript be for the current Voynich manuscript. A layperson's view of the crude illustrations within this mystery book suggests possible source material may have predated the oldest illuminated manuscripts in existence. They came from the Kingdom of the Ostrogoths in the 400 to 600 AD period. Or if the source material was from a later date, these illustrations could indicate this was not a wealthy community. Illuminated books were expensive and labor intensive, meaning in most circumstances only wealthy institutions or individuals could afford to produce them. These illustrations contained in the Voynich manuscript suggest means were not at their disposal. Even if they could afford illumination, the material was likely too dangerous to risk that level of exposure. Looking at the style of noted scribes from periods before the 13th century may provide good clues as to where this style of writing could have possibly originated. Note I refer to style of writing, a talent which in many cases would have been taught from a mentor in a particular area or region. The current copy we have of the Voynich manuscript indicates it may have been composed in Italy during the early 15th century. However, this does not mean the current material was not sourced from an earlier period of documents. For example, the depiction of a castle with towers and swallowtail battlements could have been added by a scribe while copying from earlier source material. Remember that in this medieval period, copying from a number of sources to make a book was a common practice by scribes. Replaced covers, missing pages, and different parchments are just a number of indications that the current version of the Voynich manuscript is not unaltered. Was the source material from which the Voynich manuscript possibly made produced by a scribe in a monastic community possessing heretical knowledge or a spiritual community with information deemed heretical at that time with flowing script containing no visible errors in a 20 to 25 key character language written left to right in Voynichese, this does not appear to be written original expression. Rather, this reinforces the chances of this Voynich manuscript being copied from an original source or sources by a trained scribe or learned person. Clearly, the authors were scared of persecution for some reason and had to make their important information difficult to interpret. The complexity of this script suggests it was not only dangerous at the time to possess this knowledge, but that that it was contrary to the beliefs of a dominant institution. If this was a persecuted religious or heretical sect that authored the source material for the Voynich manuscript, they may have been justified to have such fears. One looks at what happened to the Cathars in the 13th century to see how medieval dominant institutions dealt with heresy claims. Medieval to modern believes this illustrated codex may contain deep secrets that were meant to be passed on, including ancient, valuable information gathered from much older, unknown documents. However, due to the time and place where the authors lived, it could not be made too obvious and place them in danger from authorities or dominant organizations. Concealing heretical ideas during a period of inquisitions or absolute power was necessary, especially scientific information or that which challenged existing beliefs in a profound way. Another key area to uncover involves the circumstances of Mr. Voynich's acquisition of this manuscript. Wilfred Voynich appeared to be the recipient of good fortune when he came upon the sale of 30 manuscripts in 1912. These manuscripts were part of a proposed sale in 1903 to the Vatican Library. Curiously, the college did not consummate this transaction until 1912. What were the issues which caused a nine-year delay? 
especially if Collegio Romano's Society of Jesus was in dire financial straits in 1903. Could the value of the Voynich manuscript have lost its worth to the Vatican Library and they did not wish to purchase it? What did they know about the Voynich manuscript that the college was selling along with the 29 others that were sold to Mr. Voynich? As for the society, it would have made a great selling feature if they told Mr. Voynich the papers had such high value the Vatican Library wished to purchase them. When esteemed professional antique book dealer Hans P. Krauss was unable to find a buyer for the Voynich manuscript, he donated it to Yale University in 1969. When one thinks of the great interest in this mystery book and those in the past that wished to possess it, why was the interest not there for such a famous item? These fresh perspectives are meant to open new avenues of discussion and methods of discovery to help solve the Voynich Manuscript mystery. They are presented in the spirit of helping to open new approaches and spur additional ways to help solve the mystery of Voynich cheese. Perhaps there are those out there that have unknown information to guide a fresh path in the Voynich Manuscript mystery. If so, we can hope they come forward to reveal such knowledge. After all, their information may not only help solve the Voynich Manuscript, though help solve other mysteries from the past connected to this fascinating book. Thank you for supporting us at Medieval and Modern. Please be sure to watch our next episode or one shown at the end of this video. Also, be sure to like, subscribe, comment, hit the notification bell, and spread the word about this channel so we can create more exciting content. I wish you good tidings as we remember that sharing knowledge has been a noble deed throughout the ages.